All right, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to UNE's One Night Teach-In on Climate and Justice. My name is Juliana Horn, and I am a junior studying, studying environmental studies with a minor in climate change. Um, I'm going to be your moderator for this evening's panel discussion on taking action and the importance, importance of finding your place um, among the different ways of getting involved in different outlets pertaining to climate change. Um, each of the panelists are going to speak for about five minutes on their area of expertise. Um, after all the panelists' comments, we're going to open it up for questions and discussions with the audience. There's going to be a microphone being passed around um, for those asking questions, but if you don't want to use that, you can also just speak up um, and raise your hand. So we're going to start off with our panelists this evening. First off, we're going to have Kiara Fishcorn. She's a senior here at UNE studying marine affairs with a climate change minor, and she's presenting on youth activism. Um, then we have Dr. Brian Duff, associate professor of political science here at UNE, uh, Leah Lowry, director of programs and outreach at the Climate Initiative and Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, which you just heard from, president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, and finally, Dr. Richard Peterson, Professor of Environmental Studies here at UNE. And we're going to kick it off with Kiara. Thank you so much for coming out here. And I'd also like to say thank you so much to everybody who has helped put this on. As you just heard, my name is Kiara. Um, I am the DE&I rep on USG. And I also have the privilege of being the president of the lovely environmental club on campus Earthseco. Um, and on top of all of that, I am also a pretty outspoken environmental advocate. Um, I believe that youth activism does not have to have one singular definition. Activism can be simply picking up a piece of trash off the beach. It could be calling and writing to your local representatives. It could just be being that person who's always bringing up the prevalent issues in class. And because there doesn't have to be a fluid or singular definition to activism, anyone can be it, really. You know, I'd, at its root, activism is about that spurring collective, that wanting to make this world a better place than which you came in. Um, and when you think about it specifically with climate change, youth activism is at the forefront of the climate justice movement because it is the only thing we have ever known. We were born into this climate crisis and we're gonna be the ones inheriting all of the problems that come with it. I mean, you think of Hurricane Katrina, you look at all the hurricanes that are growing in intensity. You think of the wildfires that are growing across the country that are decimating entire towns in California. And when you think about how Texas froze overnight these prevalent national, uh, natural disasters are stuff that we are going to have to face and we're going to have to solve the problem of. So that is why it's the youth leaders who are leading this climate crisis and this climate justice movement. And it's just so incredib incredible and inspiring to see how many young activists are coming out of the climate justice movement. And through my five minutes here, I kind of wanted to talk about a few of them. Um, one of the most incredible examples and compelling examples of youth activism within the climate justice movement is the Juliana versus United States co federal court case. Um, if you haven't looked into this, I definitely recommend looking it up on YouTube. In 2015, 21 youth activists, literally children in elementary school who should be on the playground, sued the federal government the executive branch and the president of the United States of America for failing to provide a stable climate for us gr to grow up in. Like, I just cannot imagine the audacity that they had to do this, but they did it. <laughs> um, they sued the president of the United States for failing to provide a stable climate, saying that with, it, with um, ignoring that carbon emissions were going to increase this climate crisis, they have violated our constitutional right of life and liberty to live on a planet that is free from a climate crisis. This court case is still being de um, decided on in the federal courts, but even with that, it has already inspired so many other children across this country to demand accountability and have already started to sue state and federal governments, demanding that they have a livable future. I am just always in awe of how so many young people all across the, the nation are becoming more and more active regarding the, um, speaking in the climate crisis. <laughs> One of my favorite examples that I really want everybody to know about is a young girl named Mari Kopany, otherwise known as Little Miss Flint. Flint, Michigan really is, in my opinion, the centerpiece of environmental racism that is being um, exacerbated with the climate crisis. At just eight years old, Mari Kopany has noticed how the water in her town of Flint, Michigan was decimating communities and lives, 
how the lead in the water was just creating a massive health crisis, spreading sickness. And because nothing was being done, the news wasn't covering this, she just decided to go right to the top. And as a third grader, she wrote a letter directly to President Obama saying, why aren't you paying attention to the people of Flint, Michigan? And it sure got his attention, and it got attention of everybody else in the country. And for a week, that was the only thing you could see on CNN or any of other than the news outlets, that this young eight-year-old girl was demanding why the President of the United States was ignoring the people of Flint, Michigan. A few years later, with her advocacy, she already raised more than a quarter of a million dollars to provide free water to the people of Flint when the federal government wasn't doing so. Her as an advocate, as a young advocate, was so influential that millions upon millions of people are still donating to help with the infrastructure to get lead out of the water in Flint, Michigan. This is just such an incredible example of what we are capable of what we as the youth can do in this climate crisis that seems to be growing worse every single day. You know, and we just have so much power when we come as numbers. Some of the biggest strikes in America have been formed by just one person saying, I wanna make a difference in this world. And it seems that in our generation, because we have grown up fighting and fighting for more and more causes, that has always been that one youth person that one young adult, that one elementary schooler saying, enough is enough and I want change. And we can instill that in ourselves and our lives and it's just doing something small every single day. You know, to be an advocate doesn't have to mean you have to just DM, you know, Biden <laughs> on Instagram being like, hey, I want this to change. It could just be something as being that person who's always bringing up the issues in our classrooms. It could be just being that person on this campus who was mindful and trying to spread awareness about issues that you feel is important. But youth activism will always be the center stage of every single movement that you are passionate about, and I implore you to get more involved. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kiara's a hard act to follow. It was a good talk <laughs> without notes. Um, okay, so the time, I'm gonna use my time to talk about, like uh, Kiara like, reminded us of how many people there are out there who are showing like incredible initiative and creativity and energy and bravery. And this is for the group who just like, eh, it's not me right now. Um, I'm not, I, I, and it seems, feels like a leap, you know, to actually just get started, to, to start creating one of these stories that people will tell. So, um, you know, when it comes to climate change, a lot of the problems are, you know, technical, scientific, the solutions are almost always political. They're almost always political on several levels, but government policies uh, is a big part of it. And, um, and, and it's why political participa um, participation and organization is so important. First things first, you have to vote. Every time, no excuse ever <laughs> to not vote. Bring a friend. If you don't know who to vote for, do your best. That's what most people do. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is um, the purple bar is the youth vote. Um, that was actually 2016. It got better. In 2020, it got to 50%. Um, the map to the right is what the electoral map would look like if those bars were reversed, if the young people were voting uh, the most and, and older people the least. So it makes a huge difference, especially if young people just make it a habit, a duty, do it, and make sure your friends feel the same way. Okay, public action, right? That's, um, you know, this is how politics happens. And, you know, there is this thing that political scientists have noticed, which is there is something magical when you get together in a group. Um, when you are face to face with people and you start talking about a problem, it transforms you, it transforms the other people in the group, it makes things possible that weren't possible before. It's just fundamental to politics. And um, so, one thing you can do is join a group that's already doing this stuff. Uh, everyone else on this panel has a group. <laughs> join one of their groups, right? You know, the uh, environmental group on campus, the Climate Initiative in Kennebunk, Hip Hop Caucus. Find one that sounds good to you and show up, and you'll be amazed. You'll end up running a subgroup and getting things done. That's one way to go. I highly recommend it. 
Um, another strategy and one that I think is underutilized and has incredible potential and is the more common way that politics happens is get in a group about something else that you're into. Maybe you're into public health and you want to you know, do public health service. Maybe you're into athletics. The most classic example is people who belong to churches and they, they have like kind of church groups. So groups in the churches or the, the community. Get involved in a group and then once you're there, start bringing up the climate crisis, political action, and just get the group's energy moving in that direction. And that is actually the most common thing that has changed things in American politics. Um, that's what I recommend. So you, you might already be on an athletic team, you might be already in some other group. Take advantage of that energy that's already happening. Okay, it happens all the time. Here's a ex uh, disturbing example from a book, a recent book that I loved. So in North Carolina, the KKK, um, they're mostly interested in white supremacy. But they're having trouble recruiting people. So they were like, oh, what do people care about? Oh, the opioid crisis. So they're going door to door and they're genuinely connecting people whose families have been devastated by the opioid crisis to services, right? So they're like a public health group now. And, and then once they've got you like, you know, and they start, they're like, oh, how about the white supremacist stuff? And that's, and they're, they're building power. They are building power. And they're doing it by having a group and having conversations about like, what could we do to like get people on board? And it's working down there, right? It's disturbing, but it works. And you know, it's, it's okay, here's another example in Ukraine, right? There's a lot of groups taking action in Ukraine. They were not about um, self-defense against Russia two months ago, okay? The group on the right is literally like a ladies sewing club and now they're sewing flak jackets for, um, for people who are out on the front lines, right? It's like these groups, they were pre-existing, they knew each other, they respected each other, they, they knew each other's energy, and then once you have that, you can turn it in the directions you need to turn it. You know what I mean? And then finally, it does go full circle because group membership is one of the number one predictors of whether you vote. All right, and then the last thing I'll say, oh, I don't think I have another slide. Oh, there's one missing. Anything, oh yeah, it does make you feel better. Like it makes you less lonely and anxious. And finally, anything you do in public, it invites a group to form, right? And so if you're having trouble finding a group or it's just, this, just do something in public and see what happens. Okay, thanks. So my name is Leah Lowry and I work for the Climate Initiative as well as the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust. And some of you may be familiar with the Gulf of Maine Field Studies class and I'm totally gonna call her out because she's sitting in the back, but I co-created that with Dr. Pam Morgan and a wonderful science teacher in the high school um, locally. And part of how we really feel getting youth engaged in a meaningful way is through local action. So we saw, we saw um, in the very beginning, the, the video that happened, I actually got very teary um, with the kids who were on the, the screen saying, I am angry, I'm hopeless, I'm sad, I'm scared, and that's what we hear. Because you're looking at a world around you that is falling apart. And it's not just falling apart with the climate. There are so many issues and that is the link between social justice and climate change. And those issues are connected. So it's not surprising that you guys are frustrated and angry. And you hear it when people say this entire, this entire fight, is, the mantle is being put on our shoulders to solve it because we are the ones who are gonna have to deal with it the longest and y'all have done nothing. We haven't done nothing. It's muddy, it's complicated, but we do need you. And I'm gonna talk about a few ways that I think that youth can really gain power and empower their voices to create change. Some of the things that we recognize is that this is a global issue. Y'all are hearing stories every single day. I don't know whether it's a blessing or a curse that you guys have news at your fingertips any hour, any second, and it's global. 
you know what's happening not just next door to you, but in the next country, in the next, you know, in the next continent. So you guys are hearing and dealing with so much more. And it makes it overwhelming. So what we encourage you to do is look at the land beneath your feet. That's what you know. That's what you love. That's what you care about. And that's where you can actually make change. You do have control over the land beneath your feet on some level. It's really hard to look at the icebergs the size of New York falling off and feeling like you have any agency in that or any ability to change that. That's where the hopelessness comes in. But when you start looking at your local community and ways to get involved there, you have a chance to make a difference. And so some of the things that we have done is getting students involved in collecting data, acknowledging those huge global issues that are facing the world and how they're affecting your community. How are they affecting the campus right here at UNE that you guys walk on every single day? You have a marsh that's falling into the water. We have invasive species. We have warmer weather than we've ever had before. There are things that are happening here that you can get involved in and take, whether it's scientific data or whether it's um, social data, whatever it is, get involved in understanding how climate change is affecting your local community. That's where you have agency right here and feel like you can change and make a difference. And your voice is powerful. So what we're finding is we have students that are working on these local issues and they're frustrated and they're angry and then we start talking about looking at these issues from multiple lenses. So it's not just the ecological lens. When we're in school, we separate out all of these subjects, right? You learn about economic issues, you learn about scientific issues, you learn about social issues, then you learn about environmental issues. And rarely do we make the connection between all of them. But what I invite you to do is get involved in the local issues facing your community that deal with climate change and start looking at them through those three lenses. Yes, these are environmental issues, but who are they affecting in the socio-cultural realm? If you're from this area, there are six generations of fishermen that their kids aren't going to be taking that business over. They have to find a new way of life. Not just an economic impact to that family, but actually it, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural impact to that family. How are we affecting the, the economy of the area through climate change, right? Like a lot of people look at these big houses on the ocean and they're like, well, that's their problem. They're wealthy enough they can deal with it. That house falls into the ocean, that is our problem. That's a tax burden laid onto the people who can't afford to pay those taxes, right? That is, that is um, an environmental issue. So really being able to look at the issues that are facing your locality, not just global. What's happening in your yard where you stand? Look at them, look at how muddy they are. They are messy. And how do we find those sustainable solutions? By looking at all of the issues, bringing everyone to the table. You all are powerful voices. And one of the last things that we've really looked at is using youth voices to be an agent of change in a conversation. Catherine Hayo often talks about, all we gotta do is start talking about it, like none of us talk about it. So, Having, take the knowledge you're gaining about your community, what's happening in the land underneath your feet, and start a conversation. If I walk into a room and people know I work for a conservation trust and a climate organization, and I'm who I am and what I look like, people will automatically assume what I think, what I vote, how I feel, what I, what I believe. The minute I walk into a room, and it can shut down the conversation before I even open my mouth. The beautiful thing about the stage of life that you're in is that generally isn't the case. So what we're finding is that when we invite you all and your voices to start a conversation with community members who are different than you, who are older, who look different, sound different, may not live in the same experience as you do, it lowers the barrier to start that conversation. It's a 
powerful, powerful opportunity for you to have. And that's what the climate initiative and the Gulf of Maine field studies both, that's what we're trying to do is empower your voice to engage in climate action and inspire grassroots movements in your locality. Because by inspiring local action and pulling all the voices to the table, build the table yourselves with that community that you're trying to engage the conversation, that's where you guys will start to inspire that movement. People understand and save the things that they care about and they see and they're connected to, and that's where your local environment is actually a really great place to start. It's beyond just recycling, it's actually being able to talk about that conversation with everybody in your community and why it means, why it's gonna make a difference. Why is that marsh falling into the river gonna make a difference to this campus? Start that conversation and you'll be amazed at how far it goes. Adults will listen. Sometimes we don't listen to each other. <laughs> Most of the time we don't listen to each other. But you all have an amazing ability and a superpower, really, to be able to start these hard conversations that can inspire a movement. And so that's what I encourage you to do. Look in your local landscape. Understand what you know. Go for the things you love. Start understanding climate change and social justice in your community and how those are affecting the livelihoods and the lives of the people who live around you and with you and start that conversation. Because it's not gonna work until we bring everyone to the table to have this conversation and until people understand how it's working in where they live and the things that they care about. So that's my shtick. Um, you just heard me. I'm Rev here with the Hip, Hip Hop Caucus. I'm really honored to be here with everybody on the panel, especially my sister at the end, proud to the people. <laughs> um, and that's my goal. My goal is having more young people or more women leading this movement. So I'm excited always when I see that. I think that there should be a panel of just them, to be honest, and young people. Um, so I just want to use my time to show you a clip of a documentary that we're working on. I kind of mentioned it, but since you're here in this panel, you get an extra, like, extra, extra, because you get like the, you know, like the thing. So this is actually a documentary that we're finishing up. It's called Underwater Projects. It's being done by Dream Hampton. Um, I really, my goal was to get other people like Ava and Dream and just some of the people who are in Hollywood who are amazing storytellers to be doing this work. Dream Hampton did Surviving R. Kelly. And so she actually is doing this piece here. And Underwater Projects is a documentary. It's about, um, it looks at how climate affects public housing. And so, and looks at how a lot of communities, which was in New Orleans and other places, and so in that aspect, um, what it looks at is Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia is very similar, um, is very similar to New Orleans because below sea level has a very, has a high level of poverty. Um, it's really only one way in, one way out. So if a category two or three storm hit Norfolk, um, it would have more dis more destruction than it actually happened in New Orleans, and so and then they're also they're using um, climate change in the city to create climate gentrification. Um, so those are some of the issues that we had to deal with in this conversation. So it's much deeper than that. So I want to show you this little clip um, that is being done. So that's one thing, and then also because that'll be my whole time there. Just make sure to check out my podcast. It's called The Coolest Show at thecoolestshow.com, super dope. It really focuses on particularly um, a BIWOC, black, brown, indigenous women and women of color, leaderful movement. So I just interview predominantly people who look like that. Um, and it really talks about climate liberation um, and what it means for that standpoint. So check out The Coolest Show. We actually come back on for the fourth season um, on April 4th. So, uh, which is next Monday. So, those are my two things. And when you're ready, yeah, crank the volume up and they can, this is our documentary. It's, it's I am originally from Louisiana. All right. All right, now, I like that. When Katrina hit New Orleans, 
1,833 people lost their lives. Now, if you can go to a place that if they were hit by a category one storm, it would have more disastrous effects. I said, well, where is that place? I'll be there. They said the Hampton Roads Norfolk area. A rock from space slammed into what is now Virginia, and besides really ruining the days of a couple of dinosaurs, it also left an intense crater, which made the water around what is now Norfolk deep. That's my beach right there, and the two lakes on the side and my pool in the back. The main ways out of the area in an emergency funnel to a set of just a few tunnels and bridges. There's probably not another locality that's facing uh, the challenges and the threats around water. I'm not trying to see my area on the news talking about body counts and we can't find this person, we can't find these people. The naval base in Norfolk equates for the largest percentage of any industry. There's also the Langley Air Force Base, NASA. But all of this military infrastructure is going underwater. The government must be working on fixing this show, right? No, 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 my friends. It's not two billion I'm or twenty billion, as you said. I'm it's one hundred trillion dollars. Let me, let me because, because I actually the flood wall stops where the public housing area begins. St. Paul's, like many public housing communities around the country, is more prone to climate flooding than the rest of the city, further complicating the question of what to do about public housing and families who need housing support. So you're looking at multiple billions of dollars to try to build a living with water situation. You've got to rebuild it back in a way that lives with the water. So they offer Section 8 vouchers and things like that to get people to move other places. People are running out of places to go. Hold up. How are we the ones being hurt the worst by a climate crisis that we contribute to the least? We used to mainly smell car fumes, and we didn't smell them anymore because we were growing things. You spend your life trying to transform it so that privileged people can then just push you right out? My God. It's a long process. It's like I say, it takes a whole village. We understand that this is an issue that affects us more than everybody else. Climate justice and environmental justice, all of it is centered on racial justice. We don't have any other choice but to figure this out for our future. Yes, you're in harm's way, but yes, you can be the solution to the rest of the country and the world to fix this climate crisis. So, well, th thank you all for being here. My name is Rick Peterson. I'm a professor of environmental studies here at uni. Start right out with this. To one who doubts the worth of doing anything if you, can do, if you can't do everything. You say the little efforts that I make will do no good. They never will prevail to tip the hovering scale where justice hangs in the balance. I don't think that I ever thought they would, but I'm prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. Where to put the stubborn ounces of our weight? The opportunities are endless, as we've heard here, and often they can overwhelm. The poet urges us to claim the right to choose who gets to feel our weight and to never let go of that right. Oh. Our weight as individuals matters. Drops in the bucket? Francis Moore LaPay reminds us that being a drop in the bucket is magnificent. The problem is we cannot see the bucket. Our work is helping people, this is what you're doing, helping people see that there is a bucket. There are all these people all over the world who are creating this bucket of hope. And so our drops are incredibly significant. Now, individual actions are clearly part of the solutions puzzle. One individual locus to feel our weight that has been making news of late is to take the pledge. Oops, I guess it's missing. There it is. Maybe you've seen this. 
the pledge is, a committing, is committing ourselves to ask the question, very simple question, before every single decision and every action, large or small, will this take us toward or move us away from the use of fossil fuels? And yet, moving off of fossil fuels to adopt renewable energy by itself is meaningless if those systems are harnessed to the same ethos and value system that's based on relentless increasing of economic growth and the belief that unlimited material increase is the basis of the good life. Scientist, policymaker, presidential advisor, dean, and author Gus Speth writes, I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Perhaps our first step of taking action as individuals is to feel our weight, taking stock of our deepest sense of what really matters, what is really important. What do we truly value? What truly gives our lives meaning? And perhaps we'll find with Thoreau that, quote, we are rich in proportion to the number of things we can afford to let alone. Jim Rice reminds us, though, that the problem is also structurally intentional in terms of cause, and therefore solutions must also be intentionally structural. And so we need to also act collectively to pool the stubborn ounces of our weight with those of others, to join in that long-standing practice and potentiality known as social movements which throughout history have wielded their power to bring about social change. And a key part of social movements are social change organizations. And there are so many of them wielding their weight right now, this very moment, all over the globe. So much is happening, much more than any one of us is conscious of, in part because we simply have not heard about the many thousands of organizations quietly and not so quietly doing their thing all over the world right now. There are so many options for getting involved as my fellow panelists have, said, have showed us. I want to just highlight a few because they cover the gamut in terms of what stage each of us is at along the journey of our lives for the youth you all have already heard, likely, of the Maine Youth for Climate Justice, doing amazing work right here in the state of Maine. The Sunrise Movement, a little bit larger, more regional, going global, and of course, Fridays for Future that Greta started. All three of those were started by women. Climate Justice, the Climate Justice Alliance, Earth Justice is, has been already mentioned. I love their motto, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. And in the indigenous community, the Indigenous Environmental Network is doing amazing work. And for those of us who are 60-something or beyond, here is your hand if you're 60-something and beyond, because we're part of the solution too. We need to be solutionaries. We can't just tell the young people that this is your, you guys are going to fix it. No. Third act, recently created by Bill McKibben, Jane Fonda, and Bernie Sanders, is saying, it's our turn in our third act to do something. Uh, and we have, we have money, we have resources now. Uh, we've got some knowledge, maybe, maybe a little bit of wisdom. We can't shove it off to the young people. Third act is doing some amazing things for the 60-something generation. Citizens Climate Lobby, very deeply involved in the political process and lobbying. And I really like this one, elders, climate action, as the hair on my head starts to disappear, uh, uh, that, that uh, 
that there are some elders that may be a little older than me that I can also learn from. May each of us feel and assert the stubborn ounces of our weight. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, so thank you for your comments and expertise in this area on this panel. So we're going to open it up for questions, comments, all that stuff. Uh, feel free to address your questions to the entire panel or one particular person or the audience in general. We have a mic going around for anybody who's interested. Oh, hit it. Okay. Um, so uh, let me try and figure out how to ask this. So uh, to use a rhetorical example, if my uh, my uncle who watches too much Fox News gets his gets his news stories from Facebook, the way to sort of bring him around would be compassion, empathy, and patience. But so that's not a problem that need I that's a problem I know how to solve. But what do you do about what do you do about the really bad people? Like uh, Reverend, I believe you mentioned the uh, the people in the wake of Katrina, the uh, big business owners who are selling climate denial. What do you do about that sort of evil? So the reality is that's a great question. And that's where um, politics does come into play. And policy is critical. Uh, one of the things that we say at the caucus, which we call Hip Hop Caucus, the caucus, is we say that either you shape policy or policy will shape you. Um, so um, there's a need to understand that there are those who are going, who the moral argument, the, the scientific argument will not work. And so you literally have to, in some cases, just shut it down. And so I was glad to hear Gus Spett's name mentioned. Me and Gus actually were arrested um, outside of the White House. Um, and and so it was just, there are times, and, and please know I don't like to get arrested outside the White House, um, <laughs> but you have to sometimes put your body against the, the gears of the machine to bring it to a halt. Sometimes that also doesn't work. And so this is why I mentioned earlier with the, the shareholder, literally from the inside out strategy, um, literally going inside to these corporations in many cases, and, and in essence, in some cases, taking them over. Um, and creating that. But the reality to your question is that there are those who, you know, that question, there are those who are going to be hell-bent on their greed. There are going to be those who are hell-bent doing a number of things that, unfortunately, um, that is the battle. Um, there, is, there is the battle in which you have to then change that. So I'll anybody else want to chime in. I'll say quick, yeah. I mean, that's, politics is a contest. It's a fight. And you just have to out-organize, out-hustle, be creative, fight dirty occasionally, and, 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 and that's the way it goes. I also think bringing more people to the table. So right now, you know, you, you talked a lot about our, we're in our silos, and, all, and, and I think the environmental movement is a perfect example of that. There's a lot of people who have the same idea, are going about it a little bit differently, and aren't necessarily breaking that silo down to bring everyone to the table. And the larger that group is, the more powerful it can be in, in out-hustling, as you would say. <laughs> Hello, I've got a question for you, uh, Reverend Lennox. So you've worked with documentaries, making music, making podcasts for kind of in service of aiding the climate in the future. Why do you think media is such a strong vector for changing minds? and? How do you use that in your personal experience? Like, is there kind of a design ethos you're going for? Yeah. Well, I believe that um, this, it was once said that he who controls the media controls the masses. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent. And so media is powerful. Um, as you, When I did my little thing for Netflix, you know, one of the things I used in there was that the two reporters got it that actually was the change that there was the that when those two characters said the don't look up process that other media around the world it actually with, without that as a key component then the the kids were in flint um 
um, who were pranking and moving people's cars with the little radio active to actually end up moving the comet, then it wouldn't have happened if the media was not instrumental. I think that media and storytelling and native organizing is critical to this process. That actually goes to the tail end to the other, to the last question, because I do think that there's a need to tell the story um, in different ways for different people. Um, the trail I just showed everybody um, for underwater projects was, if you noticed, you know, if you're from a climate perspective, it was 99% people of color. Um, that is not by mistake, right? Because, um, because then, and also it's not forced. Everybody in that story wasn't the victim. It wasn't like people of color were only people who were, oh my, it was everybody. You had the mayor, you had the activists, you had those who were affected by Section 8 housing, you had the community leaders, you had just the women talking about this, my, this, this, is my, this is my lake, this is my sea. You had all those things going on, and um, it wasn't isolating because you had people who were white in the trailer, but it was just important that if you're black, to be honest, and you're brown or you're red, when you see that, then that becomes that media, that re representation, you then say, oh, this is my issue too. And so the thing about that, which, and so that's very, very important. So media has, a, has the ability to shape the story. And I think that what we see, there is something now um, um, that's been put out there where media has that, has been, has that aspect. So I'll stop, that's my little, my little card up here, I'll stop there. So I'll go ahead and ask my question. So um, Rick, you pointed out that the youth climate movement, most of the leaders are women. And Reverend, you also mentioned you think women should be in the lead. You're also, all of us, are, I think, are in agreement that we need to bring everyone to the table. But I'd love to hear from anyone up there if you think it would be good to have women in the lead, and if so, why? Okay, let me just. Let me think of all the environmental classes I've had as a senior. So um, when we look at the climate crisis movement, it is predominantly black and indigenous communities that are facing the effects of climate change the most. We know that. But within those communities, it is women in the black and indigenous communities that are facing it even more. So to have women understanding their perspective in the climate justice movement, being able to be in a position of power where they can say wh what action should go where, what should we do to come, um, what should we do to figure out this issue? How can we go about solving this crisis? How can we go about solving this issue in an equitable way where everybody is involved? I think that is why we need to have women in power more because they are at, that demographic is the mo most at risk against the climate crisis. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to add one reason why, why I say that, and this is very important. So I think that a lot of times we forget and many folks who come from certain communities, not necessarily just white communities, but usually sometimes upper middle class, middle class communities, and particularly when you're from this neck of the woods in New England, um, you're from Vermont, you're from, you know, obviously Maine, um, Massachusetts, and then you go to California, Oregon, so forth, so on. The thing is that a lot of times people forget that they grew up being an environmentalist from a traditional standpoint. And they grew up thinking that it was, you know, what it meant to be taken to the woods in that aspect. What happens there that other communities are also also being environmentalists, maybe differently. And so the community I came from, you know, my mama might not have been a quote environmentalist or a conservationist, but she would have said, put that towel by the front door, it's a draft coming in. Or she would have said, put the plastic on the windows, we got to keep this utility bill low. And that might have been the, the traditional way. Or my uncle might have said, we're going out to the woods to go fish and we're going to do certain things. They, that wasn't coined in that way. We have to understand that when I say that is that we have a movement that has been predominantly male that is running a movement and then it isolates predominantly people of color and women. And what I'm saying is that I'm not trying to get rid of anybody. I'm not trying to replace anybody. But I'm saying that you're, we're missing the genius of other people to solve the crisis. As a matter of fact, I actually think that we also are very, too academy driven. I actually think that we need to have a very much a Fannie Lou Hamer type of movement 
where we're finding a genius outside the academy, someone who can say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that kind of energy, that kind of passion, that you kind of, to be honest, gets diluted in these hallways because you begin to think about your curriculum and your thesis and your, your career. You're not out there in those streets. And so what we need both the streets and the suites. And so when I say that, it's not just, I want you to understand, it. I'm not just saying that just to say, because I think it's a nice novelty and it's a nice response. I really believe that women who are leading in this movement, people of color, are the solution to the crisis. They're, we're missing that voice at the table. And so, it's, so that's the thing. And I also think that now, keeping it 100, I think that sometimes the opposite also happens, that we're now creating a youth movement. I actually am not a fan of youth. I like young people because I like leaders. And I believe that young people should be leading as well because they, they have a 21st century model that others don't have. They can use social media in ways and TikTok and Instagram, and they can connect with their global citizens. And so they can connect differently and so because of that, we need that leader to be in there. My, well, my team at Hip Hop Caucus, and please, anybody wants to be an intern or wants to work, we, we, we hire and we got jobs, good nine. Um, we're based in LA and DC probably, but you could be anywhere really. But I say that, we have folks there, Hip Hop Caucus itself, as August in turns 18, we have people there who were two and one when the organization was created, but are leading. My, my, my producer of The Coolest Show, is Destiny. She has her own organization called Generation Green. Destiny Hodges, you should look her up if you see her. She is a black woman who does with liberation, uh, environmental liberation, and so she's centered, her centered in, in blackness how, and, and black futurism, but in that process, she's the, the producer of The Coolest Show. She's literally the one who tells me how to, so when you see the guest, she's the one leading on that. And not, not, not no kind of kitty table standpoint, but really leading really coming in there. So when I say that, I'm looking for leaders, but I'm also looking for people who are willing to lay it on the line. And I think that sometimes we just need that. So I just wanted to add that. I didn't want, I didn't want you to get this sense that it was just, I'm just saying that. And I think that what we said earlier, um, which was very important, is that I honestly think people in the climate movement don't even know what, it, what a, and Leah Thomas wrote her, just wrote her book, you should get that book, Intersectional Environmentalist, amazing, uh, uh, a book that just came out. Um, what I'm saying is that I think our movement doesn't even know what it looks like to have a diverse movement. And that's hurting us. So. All right. Shout out to Pam's Women in the Environment class for me knowing the answer to that question. But <laughs> we're at the end of the hour, so I'm just going to thank all of our panelists here and everybody who asked questions. Really thank, thank you guys for coming out.